Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Vattenfall. Welcome to uh, Energihuset. My name is Eva Timstrand, and this is the location for Vattenfall's seminars during the Almedalen week. We're really happy that you're here. And uh, I also want to tell you that we have quite an extensive seminar program during these days. And the easiest to follow our program is if you right now go to energihuset.info, as you can see on the screens. Here you find information about the program, speakers, but you also have an opportunity here to participate during our seminars and interact with certain questions that would be addressed from the moderator. So already now I would go to energihuset.info. We are interested to hear what your thoughts are on the different subjects that we present here. And as I said, one way to do that is to interact through your mobile. The other way is, of course, that towards the end of the seminars, all of you will have a chance to address your own questions to the panel, and the moderator will let you know that. So already now you can start thinking of any kind of questions that you might have. Now, something that is extremely important for us in Vattenfalls is safety. So I would like you to look to your right, uh, where you have your green and white exit signs, and also to your left, where you actually came in. In case of emergency, and we need to evacuate these premises, that's the location where you would go. And now, we hope you will enjoy and participate in our seminar today. And I would like to hand over to our moderator this morning, and that's no one else than Cecilia Hellner. She's head of Vattenfall's EU office in the Brussels and in our Brussels office. So please welcome Cecilia with a round of applause. Th thank you, Eva, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's very nice to see you here. Uh, and welcome to this uh, debate about the energy union where we're going to explore and investigate what is in it for Europe's climate and energy future. And to that end, I am very pleased to welcome the panel, four prominent panelists. And I will start with Sabrina Schulz. Welcome. Uh, Sabrina represents E3G. You can, if you want to. <laughs> Uh, E3G. E3G stands for Third, energy gener em Third Generation Environmentalism, and it is an independent organization which acts to accelerate the, the global transition to sustainable development. Sabrina is head of E3G office in Berlin. And then I would like to welcome Pierre Schelkens, deputy head of cabinet of European Commissioner Arias Cagnette, in charge of climate action and energy. Welcome. Then Anders Wickman, very welcome. Anders is politician and chair of Miljömålsberedningen, which translates into, I think, uh, this, the Committee for Environmental Objectives, something yeah. like that. It's a, it's a complicated yeah. name. Cross, cro cross party committee on environmental objectives. Yeah. Uh, and I, nev I never used that. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a committee appointed by the Swedish government to develop a strategy for a low-carbon society in 2050. And Sabine Froning, welcome. Head of Public and Regulatory Affairs, Stakeholder Relations in Vattenfall. Very welcome. Uh, before I kick off the questions to you, I would like to give you a short um, introduction to frame the discussion a little bit. And I will, after that, I will engage with you, the audience, right from the beginning with a question. So you can prepare for that. Um, but this introduction, it's just to say that, uh, as you are aware, in December 2015, Paris will host the latest uh, round of the UN negotiations known as uh, UN climate negotiations known as COP21. And the overarching objective of these negotiations is to achieve a legally binding agreement among all parties, both developed countries and developing countries, which limits the rise in global warming to two degrees Celsius by 2050. And while there are now 
uh, signs of convergence and commitment to a deal within the international community. I think it's also fair to say that um, it seems much work remains to be done. And if we look at Europe, uh, the European Union has set itself a very ambitious target um, and has long been a leader in uh, raising awareness of the importance of climate change um, globally. Individually and jointly, member states have invested a lot of effort uh, in, in to ensuring a strong response to climate change and also uh, initiated a, a trans transformation, a transition of their energy systems. Um, and we will discuss today what will change under the new uh, European Energy Union concept. What is this energy union and who wants it and how can it facilitate uh, tackling global climate change? We will also look a bit into how, um, how, where in the process are we when it comes to transformation of the European energy system. And of course, also um, discuss a bit what the implications for utilities like Vattenfall. And uh, with this, that's my introduction. And now I would like to launch a question to you in the audience. And uh, as Eva said, uh, you should go to energihuset.info uh, and there you will find the question and you will um, answer the question by press tyck till, as we say in Swedish, tyck till, give your opinion. And the question reads, uh, how important uh, do you think it is that the European acts as a front runner in fighting climate change? So the, uh, there are two uh, alternatives here, two options. It is important. Europe's engagement as a frontrunner is convincing to other countries and will lead the way to a success at COP21 in Paris. And the other option is no, it's not important. There is no reason why the EU should take a leading role in combating climate change. So now you can give your view by pressing wow. That was a very interesting response and uh, also interesting for you in the panel. Uh, to uh, to think about uh, it's changing a bit. Yeah. it is uh, yeah but it's still a very very uh, clear majority in favor of Europe being a front runner um, I would like to start with a, a short question to all of you to warm up a bit um, in the panel and I would like to have a yes and a no will 2015 be the year in which decision makers, makers are able to establish the much needed climate for change. And yes or no, what do you think, Pierre? Yeah. Sabina? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Sabina? Yes, the climate and for change is there. Yes, but. Okay, <laughs> then I ask you, uh, Anders, since you were a bit hesitating, why <coughs> could you elaborate shortly on why this but? Well, if we compare the situation today with the five years ago or six years ago ahead of Copenhagen, what we were aiming for then was a legally binding agreement. It was sort of a top-down agreement where countries would, would commit uh, to certain uh, reductions. Um, that was thrown out of the window. And what we now have is a sort of pledging um, activity or, or uh, round, um, and there is no guarantee whatsoever that we will meet the two degree target, probably not even the three de degree target. So, so while I agree that something will come out of Paris and it's better, better than nothing, I'm afraid that it will not provide us with the, the needed framework to really move uh, sort of aggressively in the right direction. And that's why I think uh, other actors are becoming more and more important. Companies, cities, etc. Uh, any comments? From yeah, no, I think I think it's um, there's a, of course um, uh, I think uh, Anders describes it quite well. 
the process is, is, is different from before. So it's true, uh, the Kyoto system, w which we had that in mind when we, we did Copenhagen, was a top-down uh, system, kind of based on scientific analysis and then top-down into what we needed. This is different, it's bottom-up. At the same time, it makes it, it, makes it uh, also more likely that we actually move forward a bit on the road. Uh, this, listen, I mean, Paris will not deliver uh, the agreement to solve climate change. Uh, it will take us some way on the road, and more importantly, it will, it will, it will allow us to have a structure uh, in place. So what we are aiming for is a legally binding agreement. These pledges will be within the legally binding framework, so it's a bit more than just a pledging uh, come first. There is a legal structure, notably on, transpa on transparency, monitoring. These are, these are red lines for, for the EU, for the US as well. Uh, and, uh, and it's moving towards the long-term target of 2050. That's why the G7 uh, agreement on the long-term target was very important. We have Americans, Japanese, Canadians now signing up to the idea of a long-term target 2050. So you have to see Paris as a starting point with a certain level of ambition, the long-term target, and a process of review of raising ambitions between now and the long-term target of 2050. If we don't have that long-term target, we, are, we don't know where we are going mm. okay. for these reviews. That's why that is mm. extremely important. Mm. But clearly, we need to raise ambitions even after Paris. That's mm. obvious as well. But may, may, I, oh. may I say one, that I, yes, I, I, I fully agree. <laughs> the problem, however, is that we know that every year we delay um, prompt action or, or more vigorous action, it's going to be much more difficult yeah. in the future. Mm. I mean, if you started to decarbonize in a serious way, let's say 2010, you need to reduce by re emissions by, say, 4% per year globally. <laughs> if you start 2020, you know, you have to reduce them by seven, eight percent. So, so I, I, I think it's it's a very, very difficult uh, challenge we have. But I agree, it's 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 of course good that we have something. Mm. Unfortunately, Paris is not Sabina. all we have. Yeah. Um, there will be, um, as you're saying rightly, there will be a ratchet mechanism. So every five years, there will be the opportunity to review what we've pledged before, uh, and even in between, we will have to adjust um, our commitments. And we will not all, like um, globally, will not all look towards uh, the Paris Agreement, whatever shape it will take eventually. But we will take um, a closer look at our very own national interest and realize we cannot, um, we cannot live in a world of uncontained climate change. Mm. So we will look into how do we create markets that uh, can absorb and uh, allow uh, low carbon investments uh, to develop. And the second thing is, um, how do we risk manage uh, the impacts of climate change? We will realize it's in our national interest that uh, we, we tackle the risks we're exposed to domestically, but also internationally. We're all so interconnected through global supply chains. We cannot risk for um, ruptures in these supply chains, but um, severe weather events will do exactly that. So we will wake up even in between these um, five-year periods. Mm. Uh, you mentioned national response and uh, looking at the EU um, and the U European Union strategy, Pierre. How, how will the European Union strategy facilitate uh, tackling climate change? Uh, could you, yeah. could you elaborate? And I, I would like to, yeah, I think the idea is to understand what impact just for climate mm -hmm. change? Of course, there's a lot of things in the European Union strategy, but if you can well, elaborate on its well, relevance... I think, I think one, of, one, of, one, of the, one of the main driving forces of the Energy Union strategy is preparing for the transition of the energy system to a low-carbon future. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, uh, this, this implies that you need to, of course, look at your climate policy, but you also need to, look, need to look at your energy policy in a much more fundamental way. And that this is why we inscribe it in a general, in a general uh, approach, and I think a very, very broad approach to our energy system. Issues such as, such as the, uh, the common European electricity market. Mm -hmm. If we want to get more renewables in the, into the grid, we need to go towards a more European market. We need to prepare these renewables also to become market-driven. Yeah? Uh, not all but some of them need to start be becoming market-driven. If, if we re really want to have a higher share of renewables, we're doing quite well, but we could do better. We are now at 26% of renewable in the electricity system. 2000, 2030, we are likely to be above 50% of renewable in the electricity system. 
And the decisions we take now are the decisions that actually allow this to happen, facilitate it mm. happening. Uh, and that's why you need to look at the grid. You need to look at, uh, you need to look at uh, the interconnections. You need to look at flexibility mechanisms between member states to, uh, to, make, it, to, make, to make it easier to reach these targets. That's, what, that's where the energy union comes in. So the energy union provides, if you want, the framework and the structures for this, for this transition. We can talk more about detailed things, but for instance, on the 15th of July, we're coming with the market design initiative. And one of the main drivers of the market design is making sure that we have a functioning European market and making sure that bottlenecks, potential bottlenecks for the increase of renewables, mm. for instance, in terms of grid, are removed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to ask, uh, maybe I can start with Sabine here, uh, I, in a way to follow up. Thinking about the energy union strategy and what, of course, we had, we had uh, t read the document and tried to understand what is the intention behind it. But where do you see the, the difficulties in, uh, in delivering energy transition? I would like to, I will ask the same question to, to you, but wh where, from your perspective, where are the difficulties in delivering energy transition? Well, I think, first of all, to me, the, the European um, energy union is a declaration of solidarity, which is extremely important, and it's a commitment to integration, which is also very important to overcome any difficulties, because I think the difficulties were quite obvious also over the past years, that is uh, to bring on the same page uh, countries that have already made quite some headway in CO2 reduction, in renewables integration, etc., and other countries that have a completely different uh, starting point. So I think that is one big difficulty within the European Union. Um, Another difficulty, I think, is the perception of cost mm. um, and the discussion on how to distribute those, uh, those costs. And I think um, initially politicians have thought and also utilities by just supporting what we want to see in the future. Uh, what we do not want to see is going to disappear um, naturally. And then a lot of other factors come into play in the market, and you see we see a little bit growing what we want to see. Um, but it's maybe we, we have an issue with uh, assets that have been planned and invested in uh, a long time ago under completely different circumstances and with uh, a completely different societal consensus. And then we need... I think there's a little bit of pushing around responsibilities um, uh, always, sort of who has to pay for it if we want to have a quick transition. It means that some assets will not be operated until the end of their lifetime, and that triggers cost. And that is a debate that we need to have in society and not only push to some stakeholders in society and push the question around how do we handle this. So that is, um, I think, another difficulty uh, where everybody is trying to hide a little bit um, and uh, yeah, push that responsibility on to, to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Sabrina? Three Same words. question to mm. you. Three words to describe the obstacles we're facing. We're facing political, structural and democratic obstacles. Um, as far as the politics are concerned, um, it's hard to generate, as Sabina was um, saying, you know, it's hard to generate a political consensus around a new model which um, entails a lot of uncertainty. Um, incumbents are at risk, lots of jobs are at risk, so we need to make sure that we manage to transition well. But I mean, it, it, if already as a politician you're having a job of governing a country, do you really want to tackle this, especially if you're facing a national election? Can you actually win? Um, so the story needs to be, you can win from this, um, and the people want it. This is where the democratic um, dimension comes in. Uh, this is not something that a government, uh, together with um, a few big players in the energy se uh, sector, can solve. This is something where the people have to give their consent, because they will all be affected by the new solutions that the new energy world will bring to them. I'm just mentioning demand side management, for instance. Are people comfortable with uh, a perceived intrusion into their privacy? They will have a stake. And last but not least, there's a structural dimension. Uh, we will only manage to transition 
if investments are flowing into the right direction, if financial markets are organized in a way that it pays off to invest into renewables, into energy efficiency, into demand-side solutions. But this obviously means that different sectors need to be integrated. Um, capital flows I mentioned already, there's technical issues. Um, Right, and, and if, if, if that's not working, if all these different um, sectors are not integrated, we will find it much more difficult to deliver on the energy transition we need. And others? Well, I, th I think I would like to go back to 2006 in, in January, February, when the Russians closed off the gas delivery to Ukraine the first time. I remember that because I was a member of the European Parliament. And I remember before that moment, it was very difficult to talk about a, an integrated energy policy for the European Union. We had a climate policy, but we had no energy policy. That was the prerogative of, of each member state. After that, all of a sudden, everybody was talking about we need an energy policy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that shows again that very often you need a crisis to, to prompt action. Secondly, I would also like to sort of, in, in, re in, in retrospect, a knowledge that none of us who were involved in the energy climate package in 2007, 2008, and we were very proud of that package, and I think it was a very good package, but we didn't discuss grid con connections. It, it was not on the table. And that just shows how little we understood. So, so um, I think we need, um, for this to work, we really need to en en elevate competences uh, in particular in the political system, and not only among governments, but also legislators. Now, what are the obstacles? Well, grid connections, obviously, and not only between countries, but also in countries. Uh, I, I listened to descriptions of the energy vendor in, in Germany the other week when we had a, a hearing in, in Stockholm, and, and they said, we have a fundamental problem, how to have acceptance about connections inside Germany from north to south. So, so that's, that's one issue. Another issue is, is, of course, who will invest in this new situation when prices seem to be, at least in the immediate future, going to be very low. And, of course, that is also indirectly or directly related to ETS. Can we hope for a better functioning ETS? Can, I, I think ETS will work eventually in the future <laughs> and have the, have the right sort of steering effect. But right now, it's not really working. And, and lastly, I think, and you touched upon demand side management, one of the beauties of this energy union when the commission presented it is that energy efficiency takes center stage. Mm. But we still, we still are, I think, struggling on how to make it happen mm. and to create an energy services market, not selling really kilowatt hours, rather selling, offering lighting, transport, mobility, or whatever. And here, I think, we have, we have a huge challenge. And I think the fact that why did renewable, the renewable energy uh, objectives, why are they being fulfilled? Because they were binding targets. And I think we need something similar in the energy efficiency field. Thank you. Um, Sabrina. Uh, if you think of, of um, the power industry, I mean, you touched upon it, but um, if, what is the role uh, for power industry if you think of um, contributing to a successful outcome in Paris? Mm -hmm. I should start with um, my perception of where the power sector is. Um, investors in the power sector tend to call for um, a level playing field, and they tend to call for certainty. But then they are not always uh, being seen as playing along. If you want a level playing field, then you need to do your very best to support the Paris process and also be there for the post-Paris process because uh, the real work will likely only start afterwards. So be a player, um, be committed, be responsible, and hopefully generate new business models um, in the end. Certainty. The new market, whatever it looks like, with new business models, it needs to be co-created. It's not something that can be um, introduced by any government or, or by the European Union. Um, market players have to seize opportunities and help shape the market. So what I would like utilities, what I would like the power sector to see is a much more 
um, is, is much more engagement in the, in the debate, not in terms of um, asking difficult questions, which is important, but also in terms of um, coming up with um, inspiring ideas so we can create the kind of momentum we need in order for the transformation in the power sector to happen. And that's part and parcel of the political solution that we need uh, Paris to deliver. So the obvious question then to Sabina, what, what are we doing in Vattenfall? <laughs> I think, first of all, as somebody said, we are committed. We mm -hmm. want to be players. Mm -hmm. We want to be visible. We want to send a message that we believe this uh, agreement is extremely uh, needed, that we support it, that there is no reason to be afraid of it, and then there are tools to make it work, unless you mentioned the, the ETS, and I think Vattenfall has been very visible in the debate on the ETS and the need to strengthen it, and that is something that we will uh, continue, but that is of course more sort of the European Union um, aspect. Um, we also uh, want to provide an occasion for the next generation, which is actually the generation that will be most affected by the discussions and the outcome of the negotiations to take part and to take a role uh, in Paris. So as we have the Gnistan project, with, which is a youth project where um, young students, 13, 14 years old, um, are looking into innovative solutions for uh, energy and, and climate. We will bring a group of these students to Paris and um, give them the occasion to engage, but also to showcase uh, what they think about uh, the solutions, uh, what are their expectations on, on policymakers, um, and give them a stage, basically. So now you have heard a few remarks here and there, uh, interesting overviews. What is that, your that take? May, may Maybe, Anders, you want no, to no comment? I, I think one, one thing we didn't mention when we talked about possible, not barriers, but difficulties mm -hmm. for this. I, I think how to deal with intermittency at, at a much higher level is, of course, a very challenging issue. Uh, I think it's solvable, but, but it's, it's going to require a lot of thinking and, 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 and who is going to pay for, for the necessary reserve capacity, etc. That is an issue where, which is, th this issue is not being discussed in Sweden, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it needs to be discussed. Mm -hmm. It needs to be discussed in all member states to form uh, a considered opinion. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be discussed at the European level, yeah. because yeah. the solutions will be much cheaper or much more affordable if we go cross-border yeah, straight away. Very, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's yeah. very clear, and I, I think the, the, the risk with that debate, and we've seen it in many member states, the risk with that debate is you get locked into national solutions, and you break up, you break up the markets. Uh, so when we look at the issue, and it is one of the issues to be looked at on the 15th of July in the market design, what needs to be done is at least looking at it at regional level. It's possibly probably too long to take, too far to take the step quite completely to the European level, but looking at it, at least in the regional corporations we have, is, is a must, an openness of these systems towards others, uh, to, avoid, to avoid that they become national solutions uh, that lock us uh, for the future as well. But I think the issue is, is very important, yes. And the reason I raise it is that we had a hearing with representatives from Denmark and Norway in the... Uh, in the committee I'm chairing the other day to listen to how they are going about climate policy st mm -hmm. strategies. And then the Norwegian representative, who happens to be an old friend of mine, Jürgen Randers, he said, my impression is that Norway will not embark on expanding the connections to the continent now because the price of power is so low, so they see no reason to, to take that risk. Mm -hmm. and this being said, Norway has this fantastic possibility yeah. with all their hydropower yeah. to help the rest of Europe. So uh, how do we incentivize Sweden and Norway to do more for the Europeans? That, that is an issue. Oh. We might come back to that, but now I would like to ask the audience for their questions, or at least check if there are any questions in the audience. I'm sure there are. Hello, my name is uh, Magnus Rosenblatt from GE, and I have a question regarding the incentives for making additional investments. 
Uh, there's something called the Juncker Plan in the European Union. Is there any connection between the Energy Union and the Juncker Plan when it comes to creating incentives for investments? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, it, it's, it, it was called the Juncker Plan. Now, now uh, you can say the Juncker Plan. I'm not allowed to say it anymore. <laughs> it's called the European Fund for Strategic Investment. Yes. So, we, so we created a new acronym, uh, <laughs> if there was a lack of any. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the, idea, the idea with the, uh, with the FC is, as you know, uh, to try to lower thresholds for projects which are just a bit more risky than the average project. Uh, we know there's capital around in Europe, and still the investments levels are still far lower than we had before pre-crisis, uh, pre-economic crisis. So this is, this is the idea, and, and uh, as I'm sure you've seen, one of the, uh, and it's a bit my reply to Anders' uh, reply, uh, issue as well, um, one of the uh, fo focus areas for the young, uh, for the FC, sorry, is interconnections. Uh, and the possibility of financing, of financing uh, interconnections. We expect quite many of the interconnectors uh, to be on the list of uh, projects and to be funded by the, uh, by the plan. We, we have made a lot of effort in highlighting this area of investment as a, priori as a priority area. The other is energy efficiency. And it's nice to see that one of the four first four projects now to be financed in the kind of pre-phase <coughs> is a big energy efficiency project in France. Mm. Uh, so this is, uh, this is th these are for us the two areas of, so th this is how the, if you want the Juncker Fund, uh, is a tool of implementing some aspects of the energy union. Mm. It's a very good example of um, something I was saying earlier on investment flows have to be aligned with our energy climate um, mm. and other sustainability targets. Mm. Otherwise we will not see the, the, the deep um, transformative changes that we need so desperately. However, at the same time, um, I also perceive a little bit of a dearth of uh, truly innovative cross-border projects. Mm. And I can only hope that BAIT and different uh, member states will really take off um, and that awareness will increase that we need to use the FC to invest into projects that would not otherwise be delivered on. But we are lacking this debate at this stage. There is still way more money to be spent. Yep. Um, but we don't have the expertise or the creativity to think about the kinds of projects that we need to deliver regional solutions that will eventually build up um, to the energy union. Do you have any comments, Anders? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear what you say because I follow the debate in the European Parliament on a distance on this particular Juncker plan. And uh, my, my impression was that this proposal from some of the M MEPs to focus ear earmark or, or ring fence uh, part of the investments for, for energy efficiency was voted down. So I was. It is, it is voted down. Yeah. It is voted down, This is true, but, that, that, but, but it is still one of the areas of focus okay. for the fund. But there's okay. no earmarking as such. Okay. This is true. Um, because I think sometimes we rely too much on market forces. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are areas where the financial community is not dying to invest mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and these are some of the areas I mean any efficiency projects they may have a payback time of seven eight or nine years mm -hmm. and that is not regarded as as uh, profit profitable enough mm -hmm. so so we need we need really support there secondly yeah. I I would also since I'm working on that a lot right now uh, the circular economy package yeah. which is due to arrive in in December yeah. I think it's very important not only to look at energy but to look at material flows also, yeah. because they are very cl closely interconnected. <coughs> and if we can use materials in a more efficient way, not only recycling, but, 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 but reuse, re re reconditioning, remanufacturing, uh, longer product life, that will have a huge effect on emissions and on energy uh, uh, demand. So, so it's, it, we, have, we need system solutions, really. Sabine? Yeah, I think from an energy utility perspective, especially a company that is active in various European markets, I think we couldn't agree more on the need for interconnections and to have political support for that. But turning it the other way around, it makes it also even more important to have the political integration, so the integration of policy, mm -hmm. because if mm -hmm. what happens in one country has such a big effect on other countries mm -hmm. uh, by being interconnected, it is important that we have a common framework yep. and not uh, 
different frameworks in, in each uh, member states, especially when it comes to mechanisms, speaking about capacity, uh, for example, how to support uh, backup capacity, um, etc. That has a huge effect um, across borders. Um, and at least right now, we, we would question whether there is a need uh, for it now, because right now we're rather in a situation of overcapacity in most of the European uh, regions. And that is one of the reasons uh, the, pr the wholesale prices are so low. Mm. The uh, yeah. lack of effect of the ETS is another aspect. Mm. Um, but of course, also that situation of overcapacity. Yeah, we, we would also question it, uh, but in the Commission. But at the same time, we have to accept also the political reality of, of that, that these mechanisms are, are exist, and are being developed. And therefore, uh, you need to at least make sure that they, do, that they have uh, the least possible damaging effect mm. on the market. Uh, and that, I think, putting them in a regional dimension uh, at least takes away the worst risks uh, uh, with, uh, with them. So I think that's, that's the, the, uh, the reasoning. On energy efficiency, um, I mean, from the Commission side, we're, we're ready to look at higher targets on energy efficiency. I think it's also, um, while, while it is true that the target today is not, mi not binding, a lot of the legislation underpinning the target is binding. When you see, for instance, the product legislation, eco-design and so forth, it's a striking figure that me, it's really struck me, uh, maybe it's obvious, but in, for me it's really struck, it really struck me strongly that we have four times more TVs in Europe today than in 1990. And these four times more TVs use less energy than the TVs we had in 1990. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is actually quite, quite an achievement. Mm -hmm. It's partly technological improvement, of course, but it's also product legislation. Uh, and the fact that we've taken away many of the worst performers uh, away from the market. Mm -hmm. These measures are something we will be ready to look at, but we are, we're ready to look at also at how we can improve the ambition level and energy efficiency. Another question from the audience? Um. Is it on? Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the discussion so far. Uh, my name is Bowie, Randall Bowie. I'm from Rock Wool International. It's the, considered the largest mineral wool manufacturing company in the world, so it's a global company. Um, I'd like to pick up on something Anders said, and also Pierre, and I think the others. I know Pierre's job is to be an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Anders is to be a realist. <laughs> and what he said about COP21 is something that my industry tends to agree with. There will be some successes, but there'll be a lot left to do. Mm. So the energy efficiency industry, including my own, is, is prepared and is preparing now for post-COP21 uh, to, to become much more engaged. Um, a couple of things about that, once again, Anders raised about the business, and Sabrina also, the need for new business models, you know, the falling prices, the decarbonization, and the simple fact that most of the consumers, which are becoming more and more important, I think Pierre has mentioned that a few times, how important the consumers will become, is that it's not energy they want. They don't, they're not the least interested in energy. They're interested in what energy brings in the form of indoor climate, comfort, uh, and lighting, And now to your heat. question. And now right. to my question. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, and I, what Andrew says about the need for moving to a new model where such services, energy services, are the focal point instead of uh, you know, measuring energy. Reminds me of something that happened about 20 some odd years ago when uh, Vattenfall had what they call the Uptrog Sugarhundren, which was, I guess, tr translated into, what, Mission 2000 or something, where they spent a lot of money and a huge amount of resources, human resources, developing or looking at alternative models. Um, I know recently that in the Commission is worried about exactly this problem. There's a binding article, Article 7, in a piece of uh, legislation which is in danger of not surviving for 2030. I think Pierre, maybe he's shaking his head so he's aware of this. Mm -hmm. 
It's one of the few really binding articles, but it's in danger. And they're looking for m other models to get the energy companies to at least begin to transform into energy service companies. My question now is, is Vattenfall in any way <laughs> looking at their old 20-year-old reports and considering maybe it's time to re revisit this concept of turning into a more of an energy service company instead of trying to sell kilowatt hours. Thank you. Sabine. Yeah, I think it's definitely one of the areas we look into. I'm afraid, as I joined Vattenfall only two years ago, uh, I'm not aware of those 20-year-old uh, reports, um, but we'll be happy to dig uh, uh, a little bit down and see what we, what, what we can find, um, whether there are interesting elements in it. But, I mean, of course, the area um, of efficiency and providing services instead of selling kilowatt hours to, to customers uh, is very much on, on our radar. Um, we need to discover and develop the business models um, which need to be well tuned with, with regulation, um, etc., so that it makes the whole uh, business really interesting. Um, the other thing is that there is, I think, what we discovered about customers is also there's not only one category. We have a lot of different uh, um, customers and they have very different expectations. So I think that our main learning is probably that we need to offer tailor-made uh, solutions for each and every customer. So we will have a much broader palette of offerings um, to, the, to the customers. But we will look to find those reports. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's one, one thing which strikes me in many of these discussions is that the digitalization of the economy and the Internet of Things is probably going to make this much easier mm. and much more feasible mm. and much more interesting. Uh, but there is, of course, a transition that's going to be quite tough. Yep. I met with um, a leading representative of Philips the other day, and he said, we are not selling lighting equipment any longer. We are offering lighting services. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we own the equipment and uh, we provide the solutions. We are being paid handsomely for this and we, our profitability is better than before and our customers are, are more, uh, have a bit gr greater satisfaction. So I, I think there are things happening that are very interesting. Mm -hmm. And the one Sabine. thing that's missing, and Sabine was um, pointing at that already, we need deep structural um, and um, financial reforms in order to, to deliver on these new solutions. Who is going to invest? Which capital markets are going to provide the capital for these solutions that have not been tested yet? So it's a much broader conversation that we need to have. Um, it includes utilities, includes um, governments, but uh, also different um, sectors of society. Um, the one risk I, I just need to say this at this stage is that uh, this uh, could become a conversation amongst uh, more progressive EU member states, amongst the front runners, and we're risking uh, to leave Central and Eastern Europe behind. They have never felt able to buy into the energy efficiency agenda. They feel that all of this is nice and fancy, but certainly not for them. And energy efficiency is not on the government agenda of any. Uh, of the governments in the region. Um, and that's why I think uh, they will try very hard to keep pushing for more energy solidarity. They will keep pushing for more new gas pipelines, whether or not uh, all, these, uh, all this new infrastructure will eventually be used in the end. I mean, even in Central and Eastern Europe, efficiency will improve with new targets or with new business models. Um, they will probably not need all this new gas infrastructure anymore. And then the real risk is uh, that they will end up with stranded assets. I, the investments haven't paid off yet. Uh, they will not generate any more money, but lots of valuable taxpayers' money and guarantees, let's say, from the FC have been, um, have been paid for it. And I think we really need to see the overall picture, right? There's uh, the progressive debate and the more technological and policy debate, but there are also the politics. And uh, we mustn't forget uh, that Central Eastern Europe doesn't really feel um, fit yet to take part in this. And how, how do you tackle that challenge, Pierre? Do you agree? And and do you to, how, to, how to, does to, the Commission to, tackle to, it? To something, yeah, to start, I think, I think you're making a very important point, uh, Sabrina, that, that uh, you need to look at the different political realities. And uh, I think it's clear that 
that uh, for some countries, you know this as well as I do, uh, the energy union is an energy security uh, dimension, uh, that we should have a respect for their position uh, on this. Uh, when you have, uh, you have six member states which are basically de completely dependent on Russian gas, uh, and this is, of course, is their main concern. Honestly, if I were them, it would be mine as well. Uh, this, I think, is, is the, uh, the uh, I, have, I certainly have a respect for that, but this is why, this is why our role is to, to kind of frame this in a broader context, yeah? of saying, yes, this is important. Yes, there is such an issue as solidarity uh, in, these con in, in this context, uh, but uh, once you push in one direction, you, when you push forward in one, on one issue, you need to push forward on the others as well. I think on, on, on efficiency, my, my, my view, I might be wrong, but my view is that the debate is changing quite a lot in Central Europe also as a result of this. Uh, a lot can be done very easily in terms of public buildings. This has a huge impact on their gas imports. Yeah? Uh, a lot of the gas, as you know, is used for warming their buildings. Uh, so uh, I, w we, we w I would tend to say that I see a shift in some of the Central European countries on the energy efficiency uh, agenda. I'm a bit more optimistic uh, on, uh, on that account. But, uh, but, the, but you have, you, 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 I think you make an important point, and that's why we need to move this into a, in a, in a, in a general context of, of saying, yes, we will help you, we will help you uh, diversify your gas imports. Uh, this will certainly be a policy for us. Mm. Uh, but as part of this, there is the climate agenda, there is the energy efficiency, there is the work on renewables, and this is also part of the whole. Mm. Solidarity concept. comes with obligations. Yeah, solidarity, so soli soli solidarity, solidarity towards in all directions. Yeah. But, Anders, short. But, but you know, I, <laughs> I, I also, I have some experience because I'm getting old, um, and I, I, I get, I'll give you one example. When I was with the Red Cross in the 1980s. We started to work heavily on disaster prevention because we saw that even natural disasters, we could, we could prevent many of the negative effects that people would, 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 would experience. It was, it was impossible to get the UN Humanitarian Office or the Red, International Red Cross to really take it on. We are a relief agency. If I jump then to the energy market, Supply side has dominated for so many decades. We only started to discuss energy efficiency seriously in the European Union some 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it takes 5 to 10 to 15 years to, to move a new issue into the mainstream. Yeah. So I, I would, uh, based on that experience, I would go on a, on, a, on, a, on a, I don't know what, campaign tour in some of those Eastern European countries. Because... It, we, we know it makes sense. Mm -hmm. We know it works. We know it's profitable. Yeah, of course it does. And I think, I think you, ha you highlighted this yourself, um, uh, Anders, the, the way energy efficiency is being dealt with in the energy union mm. strategy has never been the case before. No. It, ha it, it, is put, it, has given a prom it has been given a prominence by the Commission, mm. which puts it at equal levels yeah. as, as security. Yeah. And this is, I think, I normally say, people tell me there's nothing, there's nothing new in this. No, this is a political... Evolution, Absolutely. political change. I agree. And now I would like to see if there is another question from the audience. We have exhausted it all. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, uh, then that's fine. That's also a message. <laughs> uh, maybe to turn a little bit uh, to the issue of carbon pricing. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, Carbon pricing has an advantage, or the advantage, that is a powerful and cost-effective way of giving an incentive to, yeah. uh, for business uh, to undertake low-carbon investments. Uh, at the same time, uh, and at the same time, generate uh, financing, uh, which can be used to support climate action. How? how and I would now I have a question to Pierre, and uh, but of course uh, for all of you to follow up on, and I, therefore you have to be a bit short since time okay, is running sorry, out. Yeah, but how do you see carbon pricing develop and the use of carbon markets develop? And um, also, when you think of these multiple objectives, what what role can there be for carbon pricing? 
I think carbon pricing, uh, and I, of course, I, I think I think mainly in the EU context of ETS in that in that case, mm -hmm. uh, is um, uh, is and will remain our main our main climate change tool. Um, you will see uh, you will see it evolving uh, in a more in, in within the towards a direction where the price signals are clearer. Uh, we have done a lot of work to try to cut the slack out of the market, the backloading of allowances, the market stability reserve. All of these are not, you know, in the terms of in, in the world of principles, these are not these were not perfect. Preferably, we would have done it at the beginning, but hey, politics is about managing reality, uh, and uh, this is uh, so. And now the review that we are putting forward on the 15th of July, all of that is is aimed at cutting the slack out of the market and, and providing providing a, a clear a clear signal. Uh, it is our, our credibility. The credibility of EU climate policy hangs on ETS. Uh, if uh, if we are not, if we don't manage it, we would have also at international, at international level a big, big problem. Um, and that's, that's why I think we simply need to get it to work. Sabine? Um, maybe I can say also that um, the ETS has been heavily criticized and it has maybe not brought about the structural changes that some people had expected initially. Still, I think the European Union is on target and that is at least yeah. partially also the merit of the existence of the emissions uh, trading system, even if carbon pricing has been more like residual carbon pricing uh, in the past and the ETS can become more of a, of a driver. Uh, I think it is also, it has been a discovery journey like many other journeys. Liberalization has been another yeah, true, discovery true, true. journey, still is in a, in a way um, at the European level, but it is only, it is also proof that there can be a process of really integrated policies. And I think the big merit of this tool is it is the only policy instrument I know of mm -hmm that really applies throughout all the member states. Mm. Starting off from a system with national allocation plans and, and, mm. and what have you, this is a truly integrated tool, so it is definitely worthwhile and important to develop it further so that it can uh, deliver further signals beyond residual carbon pricing to become also a driver of the transformation because we can see um, that uh, in an integrated market, um, it is important to have that one framework uh, so that it's very clear for the utilities what, is, what are the tools that give us direction mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, investments, price developments and, and what have you. Mm -hmm. Sabrina? The ETS was, is the perfect idea, but there were so many inbuilt weaknesses right from the start that it's very unlikely that it will be delivering anytime soon, even with the MSR and the structural reform. So I'm way more cautious, especially because I can see how energy, in energy intensives um, across Europe are pushing the position that, um, you know, we just need to fix the ETS and everything is fine. No, we, it's not going to happen soon enough. We need deep decarbonization and the ETS as it stands cannot deliver this kind, these kinds of incentives that we need for deep de decarbonization um, in different um, industries in time to deliver the two degrees target. So the ETS is great, it hasn't delivered. Um, however, I must say the ETS has also been great because other regions in the world are now copying the system. And we can only hope that they will learn from the structural mistakes we made in Europe and uh, improve the system on the way, make it fit to their own markets um, and make it uh, deliver on deep decarbonization that they need as much as we do. Thank you. Alex? I agree with uh, that statement that on paper carbon trading is, is a beautiful idea. Mm. But as you said, a lot of difficulties in the implementa implementation, plus, of course, a recession in the economy. Um, and I'm just so sad, in a way, that my former colleagues, some of them, <laughs> decided not to try to fix a market instrument that had certain objectives, with the argument that, no, 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 we are not going to interfere with markets. I mean, it, it's, uh, I think it's such a silly argument. We had certain objectives with that, that instrument and, and it has not been fulfilled the way we had, we had wished. And I think the fact that over a couple of years more coal was used in the power sector 
simply because ETS prices were so low in, instead of gas was 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 absolutely ridiculous situation and, and outcome. And if it were not for the very positive learning curves for some of the new alternative technologies, we would really be in trouble now. But I think the fact that both solar and wind has come down so nicely in terms of cost means that it's not as big a problem as, as, as it had been otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would hope that we could still make this beautiful idea in theory come true in reality. Okay. We have a question. We have one question. I must spring on two minutes. Yes. Uh, okay, my name is Thomas Hirsch. I'm working at SSAB, a big steel company in Sweden. And the question is about the ETS. I think, think you, Sabrina was touching it, but can a so complex system really deliver all that expectations for that system in the market, in, in the market system? Is that even possible? So I think the question was to Sabine. To all of them. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> I, and then we have very little time left. So uh, then I, I think I give the question to Pierre and say if you could uh, if you could uh, answer it quickly, and then I will have my final. Uh, yeah, I'll no, answer it very quickly. The answer is yes, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and we maybe it's not this is not even the right moment to discuss all the details. So we can t we can discuss it, but but mm -hmm. the but the uh, yes, of course it can. Uh, of course it can provide uh, provide. Uh, uh, price uh, price signals. It, it it will have to rely also on how the market how the market develops, and of course with the economy taking forward, with decisions being taken. I mean, keep in mind, uh, actually the effort we are asking is not that insignificant in the uh, ETS sector. Mm -hmm. Quotas are now diminishing quite quickly, year to year to year to year. There will be a moment, yeah, with the linear reduction, yeah. uh, where actually this is there there there, there will be scarcity. At, at one moment, I can assure you, there will be scarcity, and uh, and yes, then it will be. Uh, see, I, I do think the shift to coal does not is not only it, it's part. I agree, under party related to ETS, but it has other reasons as well. I, I don't think it's only the ETS. Fracking sector. in the US. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. so. Now yeah. I would yeah. like to wrap up, <laughs> and I would like to ask you all of you to give your advice to the European negotiations and negotiators in Paris. One piece of advice from Anders, from Sabrina, from Sabina, and. No, not to me. <laughs> but you <laughs> give it to your boss. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think, from my perspective, the most critical issue is the relationship to developing countries. Mm -hmm. Because if we would put more money on the table to help them avoid getting stuck in the carbon economy, that is the best thing that could happen. Because then we would have a much more positive attitude. And I know you cannot lump all developing countries together because they, they are very different. It's a huge difference between China and Mozambique, etc. But still, they negotiate together. And this psychological issue of funding is very important. And I think in retrospect, not only Europe, OECD countries have shoot, them, have shoot themselves in the foot by not being more generous. It's peanuts compared to all the money we put to save the banks. It's peanuts. Okay, Sabrina? Um, two pieces of advice. The first one builds um, on your point as well. The EU has done a lot to alienate uh, its traditional allies in the developing world. It's not too late yet. But money, unfortunately, is the means to unlock these difficult um, relationships. And the EU can do much more than um, it believes that it can. And this leads me to my second piece of advice. Um, be more confident um, on so many levels, but also sell the energy union as something that we're doing on top of our INDC. We are discussing internally, domestically in Europe, how we can reform our energy markets, how we can um, develop incentives for the low carbon transformation that will not only be a low carbon transformation for Europe, but also for the rest of the world. So be more confident, be out there, um, sell the message and hopefully bring others on board as well. Sabine? Short. Yeah, difficult to add some, yeah. uh, something. Uh, I think both is, uh, is important. Um, especially, I think the EU can showcase uh, that, that there are success sh uh, stories showing that growth and CO2 reductions do not need to be contradictions. So that's something to, to bring and to convince um, others of. So make it happen. Mm -hmm. 
and now since time is running, so maybe are you happy with these pieces of advice yeah. or would you like to yeah. add something to yourself? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think I, I, would, I would add one thing, which I know the Commissioner would agree on, and that is to make sure that the EU is not taken for granted in Paris. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very mm -hmm. important aspect. Uh, not because it is important that we have a role, because I think when we have a role, it becomes a better agreement. Mm. Uh, that I think is important. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to the panel. Thanks a lot to the audience. I think it has been really interesting and, and shows how, how policy develops. I have no time to, to make a, a, a thorough summary, but uh, at least I enjoyed this discussion a lot. I hope you did too. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Cecilia.